Hey, what's going on guys? Natasha here alongside Dale for another episode of IGN House Call. They have a really, really cool guest. I say cool guest every time because we seem to have like cool guests all the time. But today well, we, we have, yeah. yeah, we really do. We have Anissa Sanusi. She is super cool, based in the UK, the coolest UI, UX, user interface, user experience designer. Probably the only one I, I know and it's really cool. But before I get too excited, I'm just gonna ask you to explain to our viewers today um, about yourself and what have you worked on in the past. <laughs> wow, that's an uh, that's a very nice introduction. Thank you. That's a, like I think I counted like five, six different cools there. <laughs> oh, oh Bale's fault. He keeps saying cool. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for having me on. It's a it's a huge pleasure. Uh, I love it when anyone from Southeast Asia asks me to come on and do these things because I don't usually get the chance to. Um, but yeah, so my name's Anissa, and uh, I am originally from KL in Malaysia. Um, about in 2009, I moved to the UK to pursue my studies and I kind of just stuck around ever since. So I studied animation in uh, when I was in university. Um, and the first two years was doing 2D animation and then from there I applied to a uh, video games company as a 2D artist which uh, was the start of my video games career um, and from that I kind of um, uh, I spe specified to UI design. So UI design is, uh, is user interface and what that means is that it's basically anything that you interact with in the game that is not the 3D environment. So. The easiest thing is like um, when you go into the start menus, so it's all the menus and your settings, your options, and then when you're in the game itself, if you're going through say an inventory system or even the HUD, when you're switching weapons and things like that. So all of those 2D stuff that you see on screen, that is what a user interface um, designer does. Um, but recently, I'm uh, quite interested in UX design as well. So every time you hear someone who does UI, you kind of can hear the title goes UI slash UX designer. Uh, that's because it comes hand in hand, the, the two jobs. It's slightly different. So UI design is like the visual designs of how it looks, you know, color theory and making things uh, pop up and, and all that. Whereas UX design, which is which is short for user experience design, is basically everything behind that. Um, it's basically how easy it is for you to uh, to get into to use or to do something. <laughs> so the idea is that it's like a bridge between game designers and players because game designers they will think of all these amazing complex systems of how the gameplay works, and what we do is we make sure that the players can understand those systems easily. You know, so like easy to learn but difficult to master that kind of stuff um so yeah um i've worked on some some really interesting cool projects when i first started out we worked on a game for the ps vita oh that was such a long time remember the vita good oh, times yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time <laughs> i actually forgot about it yeah, so that was really that was my first uh, job doing UI design. That's when I realized I really liked UI as a profession. Um, and then I moved on to a company uh, called Frontier Developments, which is they're famous for um, the Elite Dangerous games, uh, which I worked on for a, for a short time. It was really fun. Um, but my baby on that uh, on that company in that during my time in that company was called Planet Coaster. So it's a roller coaster theme park game. Um, it's kind of like a current generation version of Roller Coaster Tycoon games. Um, and I remember that because it, it had early access, so we were co constantly updating it as, you know, we had players try on like things. So it was a lot of back and forth with the players and we had like the most amazing um, fan base because they were very supportive and very like, hey, we kind of want this in, to be in the game. And we're like, okay, that's a good point. You know? And then it's a, it's a nice back and forth. Um, and after um, I left that company, I joined Hutch. Um, and at Hutch, we made uh, mobile racing games. So this is where I started really leaning into the mobile space. Um, when I was at Frontier, it was mostly PC games, but I also had a chance to work on some um, smaller mobile titles. But when I moved to London with Hutch, that's, that's when I kind of really got into mobile entirely because the difference with PC, PC and mobile games is that in on mobile, uh, on phone games, you're mostly playing the UI. Um, so it's it has a lot more. You as a UI designer, you have way more say. Um, you have may, 
a lot more influence, way more responsibility to make sure that everything is working and everything looks good. Um, and yeah, so currently I'm um, doing a secret project uh, with my cut. <laughs> yeah, uh, currently I'm uh, at a different company. We're called Netsuite Games and we're doing uh, a social MMO mobile game. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's a huge task and um, mm -hmm. we're very excited. It's, it's supposed to be like a friendly, cozy game. So it's very different from all of my past games. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I can't say much, but like I'm, I'm very excited with my current, with my new team where we're doing things that we've never tried before. Uh, obviously, you don't really hear the word social MMO with mobile put together very often. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's it's completely new challenges, you know, completely new everything, and we're learning every day as we go. Um, yeah. Oh, should I talk about limit break? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that <laughs> okay. first. I'm really excited um, to ask you about that, though. I'm not gonna lie. Yes. <laughs> no spoilers. We'll wait until then. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think you kind of answered my my question, my next question. Mm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tweak it a little bit on the fly. So as a UI UX designer, do you have any signatures or hallmarks that you kind of put your own little unique twist in each design? Uh, uh... Oh, I don't know. It's because like in in every game I've worked on, they're so different from each other. Um, it's it's difficult to be all like, yeah, this is not being an Anisa thing. But I guess. <laughs> um, oh oh, now that I think about it, this all is right. kind of embarrassing. Um, so. Whenever we try new designs, we usually try to like cast really wide nets, kind of like try different colors. Like, yeah, let's go for blue, pink, purple, silver, white, black, you know? I always, always default on this like turquoisey blue, like a very light Ooh. blue color. So um, in, at Frontier, one of the, one of the um, directors, he's always like, you always use this blue, don't you, Anissa? It's like, this is like the Anissa blue. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and then it kind of became a bit of like a, the default blue in Planet Coaster. Oh. Um, and then I realized now, like literally this current project I'm on, I'm using that exact same blue color. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> in, in wow, you should trademark UI. that color then. <laughs> you know, it's really funny, but I think there's a reason to this. Because like, if you think about color theory, the, that light blue is the most like, it's the easiest on the eyes to look at for a very long time. So, you know, if I go for bright pink or anything else, it's like, it's a bit like, I'm not saying it's, gonna, it's bad, but it is, you have to do it with intent, right? So like um, to use Persona 5 as a reference, if anyone has played that, shockingly good UI, but it also it, it also like breaks all of the rules constantly. Like they use yeah. red and black as their mm -hmm. main color. Can you imagine that in anything else? I'm just like, wow, and just make it work. And yeah, yeah, I can I can go on for like a good hour <laughs> just how great Persona 5 UI is. It is the only UI that people have cosplayed. Can you imagine that? Yeah, I've been seeing that UI used for a lot of people's streams as well because people just really like it so much. And it's just mm -hmm. so... I've never actually seen it, anything like that. And it's such a joy to use as well. Like you didn't have... It's, it's a no-brainer to use. Yeah. So I have a question about that. So when you make a UI, right? Of course, you have to mm -hmm. put yourself in like, you know, the consumer's uh, shoes. Like how are they going to perceive a UI? Um, yeah. Is it tough doing that? Um, yeah, it is because first of all, you have to really remember that when you're creating a game, you as the person making the game, you are not necessarily the target audience. So sometimes you really have to divorce yourself from like what you personally like as a designer to what the market or like your target audience would like, you know, um, I've, I've, I really had to reconcile this quite a bit with um, one of my previous games where I was working on racing games. I do not care for cars at all and I still don't <laughs> like I don't care but um, again I am not the target audience right like yeah. I need to kind of make sure it looks good for the people who are going to be staring at us for like 20 hours at a time or something you know so it's kind of like you, there's a lot of empathy that you need to learn about the people you're targeting but also at the same time it's not saying like ignore everything that you like you kind of have there's a balance between catering to a market but also 
trusting your instinct as a designer to know if something is working or not you know you still need to trust yourself to have like good eye for composition layout colors you know all that stuff so it's like a it's a balance between the two so yeah okay so can you give us an example of Okay, you already gave us an example of a good UI, which is like Persona 5. What's an example, <laughs> without naming any games, what's an example of a bad UI? Like what pet peeves do you have when it comes to bad UI? UI? Oh, um, yeah, so this is very prevalent in a lot of mobile games, unfortunately. As much as I love playing mobile games, it's the platform that I mostly work in and it's also one of the things that I constantly play on because, you know, it's always on me. But like a lot of free-to-play games tend to use what we call dark patterns um, to keep... Yeah, so <laughs> what dark patterns mean is that it's a pattern that companies or games use to keep people in the game loop. You know, when you think about like, uh, when you play a game and you're kind of like, that's a little bit, that's not, that's not cool. That's usually a dark pattern, you know, kind of like, um, like, <laughs> like, let's say you, you get an ad and it pops up way too often and then yeah. there's a close button and then it's not a close button. It goes straight to the app store or something, you know, yeah. those kind of yes. <laughs> Yeah. So like these things are on purpose and you quite you see it quite a lot on especially free to play games because you know they want as many people as possible on this and like they don't particularly care about the experience. Um, so like it's still it's still technically good UX because they're using what they know to, to do what they want people to do, but it's kind of unethical and that's my huge pet peeves. Like there is it, it kind of it brings this whole situation where whenever people talk about mobile games, they'll be like, oh, I don't play them because they're so predatory. And, you know, they just, all they do is like try to get money out of you. Um, and it's that kind of thing that I feel like is giving mobile games a bad rep because yeah. there, there's a fine line between, you know, um, free to play games. We still need to make money somehow. Like I need to still be paid and pay my rent and bills and things like that. But there's a there's a way to do it ethically and you know gently rather than just like in your face. Hey, buy this, buy this, buy that, buy that. You know. So yeah, that, yeah. I feel like a lot of mobile games. What really irks me are like you log in, the first thing you see is an ad, like a pop up. Oh yeah. And yeah. then after you finish a game, is a pop up. Or if you want to continue a game, you have to watch a video or you have to pay. Um, like gems or diamonds or whatever and I I don't know that's like kind of a turn off I found myself uninstalling so many games because of that yeah so those like pop-ups in itself is not a bad thing like having to use hard currency to get certain benefits in the in a free game that you're playing also not bad like there's so many games where I've played for so long without paying to the point where mm -hmm. when I do feel like paying the odd like two two pounds for something i feel like wow i spent so much time on this and i'm enjoying it here's my two pounds you know it's not it's not that bad but when it's like every three seconds you're playing pop up pop up pop up it's like yeah that's a bit mm. Mm, so yeah. again it's just it's, it's a balance of of these things right you want to make sure that if the player do does convert into like a paying player it's for a good reason you know and not for bad reasons that's how you get churning where people play for a little bit they find something that they don't like and then just uninstall yeah which happens i feel like i'm really excited for path of exile mobile because they mm -hmm. talked about like how they're not interested in getting people to pay money in order to get a lot of things out they're just interested in getting just the cosmetics uh to pay um, for their money and i feel like if you're going to spend a lot of time in an mmo I totally wouldn't mind spending money on their cosmetics because I'm going to be playing that all the time. Exactly. Yeah, that's the point. Like, if you want to spend money, we, we want to make sure that it's because you're enjoying it, you know? And not because, like, you're trying to beat the game or, like, move on or something. Yes. All right. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about Limit Break. <laughs> yeah, that's what she was really excited about. So, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. Um, yeah, so uh, we're okay. So, Limit Break. <laughs> um, so, Limit Break is a mentorship program aimed at underrepresented genders in the UK games industry. Hmm. So, what that means is that um, 
in in the UK especially, um, the workforce in the games industry is heavily skewed towards men. Um, and what happens with that is that naturally men tend to have um, a lot more support system. Um, mm. They basically have a lot of people to ask for help from, people who um, are in senior positions, who's gone through the mill before. Um, so it sometimes there's all these smaller things that makes it easier. Um, when you're part of the majority to like advance your career mm. so um, what I wanted was that I wanted to have like a core like space for people who aren't men um, to to join um, especially if like say you're a woman in senior position like you're a lead or you're a uh, director of your um, of your department right mm. there's not yeah. a lot of that like it's very very difficult to find women in those positions so what i wanted to do was to connect people um who are in senior positions to anyone that is new or younger or also anyone who wants to switch careers into the games industry um and it's really like it's quite important for me i think um to mm. see somebody who is like you um who are in those lead positions because you're just like oh um, you've probably been through the things that I've been through and sometimes it's also like a good sanity check where you have somebody to talk to about your problems because the thing about it, especially women, um, if you if you have issues, you tend to kind of internalize a lot of it where you're just thinking, oh, is it me or is it my boss or is it my company, the situation? Like you, do, you don't know what the issue is because you're kind of just in your little thing. And when you talk to your employees, it's a, like fellow employees, it's a little bit difficult as well because they might get treated differently because, you know, because of their gender. It does happen. Like I wouldn't say every time it happens on purpose, but sometimes it happens subconsciously. Right. So it's good to have an outside opinion, especially if someone who is more experienced than you, they could be like, oh, okay, I don't think that's you. Or maybe, oh, yeah, it's maybe partially you, but you can also improve by doing this and this and this. So that's the that's the core principle of Limit Break, where I want to connect people together. Um, and you kind of, the, the program itself will last for six months. Um, oh. The reason why it's six months long is that um, you can easily have it within the year so every year we have new intake um mm -hmm. some people uh they they really love their mentors or mentees and they continue to speak to each other um past the six months and some oh. people like it, they just don't get on and that's fine because you know it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a bit of a gamble sometimes but like if they don't then there's no like um like hard feelings oh, yeah, there's no oh, does that word right? like like the paksu. <laughs> there's no force obligation. 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 That's yeah. the word. Yeah. So <laughs> there's no <laughs> there's no obligation for you to stick around if you don't want to. Um, but yeah, so that's limit break, and also um, the the name limit break itself comes from Final Fantasy Seven. Of and course. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a move set when you when you get hit enough, you kind of have like an one strong attack back, um, mm. and also you know double entendre of like you know you're breaking the limits, eh? yeah, you're breaking the glass ceiling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So nice. Just curious, what like what made you what inspired you to start it was it like a one day you decide like okay you know what I'm just gonna start this out of the blue or was it like something you gave a lot of thought. Mm. Um, I think it was a little bit of both. Um, I when I started this, or at least when I had the idea for it, I was having some issues myself at work, right? And it's one of those things where I was struggling a lot with my day day to day tasks, and I was struggling with my relationship with my manager. Um, and it it's not like any anybody was evil or mean to me. It was just like sometimes you have relationships have this. Um, nuance to it right sometimes if something's not working and you're trying really hard you're not really sure what you're doing wrong again is that like oh is it me or is it them you know that kind of question um yeah. and that's when i just realized like oh i wish i had someone to talk to and at my company at the time there was no other senior women that i could ask for help from you know um 
and I had some peers that I could talk to, but again, their peers, they're kind of around my age, around my level. Um, they're really good for comfort, like just being like, yeah, that's a, that's a bit shit. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, that kind of thing. But also I needed like actual tangible advice, you know? Yeah. So um, uh, one day I went out with a few of my friends in London. Um, we're all we're all women, we're all just chilling and we're just talking about work generally and we started talking about like um, about promotions, you know, about training and we just realized like it's really difficult for us sometimes. That's mm. when I was just like, I just like, oh, um, I saw this, I saw this mentorship program in Australia called uh, Working Lunch and I remember thinking like, wow, I really wish there was something like that here in London and um, I got in, so I kind of, I'm friends with a person, um, Ali McLean, that's her name. She runs Working Lunch in Australia. Um, we're kind of Instagram friends. And I messaged her one day saying like, God, I wish there was something like this in London. You know, it's really cool. And then she just replied, yeah, why don't you just start one? And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, what, no. You know, I was like, who are you? And then, okay, so back to like hanging out with my friends, right? That day, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, training, blah, blah, blah. And I mentioned to them, I was like, oh, like this girl said, like I should start a mentorship program. <laughs> and they were just like, you should, you totally should. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and I was just like, what? <laughs> and then he started talking about it properly. And um, one of the other girls, she also um, started a mentorship program with her group. Um, she... She works outside of London, so it's a little bit different for where I was. And then we kind of exchanged notes for a little bit. But that was basically the kickoff for this, right? And I was thinking, you know what? I'm going to try it. Like, um, it was partially because I wanted to find a mentor for myself. But I also realized, like, this is going to be very useful for anybody who's just started in the industry. People who are, like, only one or two years in, juniors, you know? Like, you always need that extra support. So... My friends basically just pushed me saying like, yeah, that's great, so just do it. Um, so like I called another friend asking for help in terms of like how to set up a website and all that. Um, and then we, we went to squarespace.com and he was he was literally next to me and he was like, oh, just do here, do here. And then, you know, and I came to the point where you have to pay for the website and it was so expensive. And I was like, okay, okay, just pay for it. And I was, it was like, two, it was like 200 pounds or something. It was so expensive. Wow. And, I, and, I, and I was just like, okay, that's it. There's no turning back. The website's done. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and then because, you know, obviously I do 2D, 2D art. I did all the branding. I made animated gifs for the logo, you know. Um, so I went to another another girl who, um, she's like, uh, she, she runs an indie studio. So I asked her opinion on how do I make this look like it's a good thing to, to be a part of. And she was just like, oh, I think because it's something completely new, uh, people don't know if it is quality or not, right? Because you see so a lot of like these sch schemes coming about, and, but you don't know if it's good. So I was like, okay, so I think I need to use my own, say, platform because I have like a few, I have a good following on Twitter. So I was thinking, right, so I think it's, it's worth people knowing who's behind this, right? Mm. So what I did was I emailed a lot of my um, fellow female developers in all around London asking like, hey, I'm going to start this mentorship program. Would you like to be a mentor? And they were just, they were all just like, yes, oh my gosh, <laughs> finally. And the response was so good. And then um, I was so happy to have a few of my friends become mentors, right? So when I launched the website and when I launched it on Twitter saying like, hi, I'm doing this new thing, I basically said, this is a mentorship program and these are like my esteemed mentors so you know it's quality people it's good people and we all have the same um we all have like the same uh target you know like we we want to help that is the main thing anyone who's a senior woman in games they know how hard it is to to um, find advice how hard it is to to navigate the corporate ladder i guess um we all had the same issues so that kind of blew up. <laughs> I expected maybe 20 people to join. How many joined? We, en we ended up with 160 people. Wow. wow. That's a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was when I 
um, put a limit on just London because I wanted it to be um, you need to meet them face to face. You know, I wanted to, yeah. to go out, have coffee. Um, like there's a lot, a lot of uh, say nuances in face to face interactions that I wanted them to have. You know, just have that bond, which is why you know I made sure it's just for London. Um, but obviously this year, which is the second year for it. Um, COVID-19 being all like yeah F your plans <laughs> you know it's like all right <laughs> so if we have to move to remote only that's when I decided there's no point just you know shutting it down to London so therefore I open it up for the first time to the entirety of the UK industry and I've just closed applications and we're we're in the process of matchmaking at the moment as we speak um, okay we have we have 330 people apply this year. That's wow. doubled from last yeah. year. Wow. Yep. Yep. It's very impressive. Um, it's it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it also shows just how much number one, how much people really see they they know that they need the help. And number two, just how much people want to help. Like yeah. the, the energy is there, you know, they want to give back. And all that Limit Break does is give a platform for that. And all we do is connect people together. Like, I don't tell them how to mentor. I really don't. Like, I have, like, um, to everybody at part of the program, I do give them, like, a, a booklet of, um, like, basic guidelines of how to be a mentor or how to be a mentee, what to expect and all that. But it's mostly up to the people themselves to, to decide what to do. I see. Let's see. So what yeah. is, like, the biggest challenge so far you've had with um, Limit Break? Um, it is definitely um, for year one because obviously we've never done it before. Um, I've never, you know, no one knows what to expect. It, it, there's a lot of teething problems. So I guess um, the biggest issue was retention. Um, there, we had a lot of drop-offs, kind of like people really excited the first month, the second month, but after the third, fourth month, it um, it kind of tapered off. Um, I think it's not a bad thing because you know why? Like life happens, you know, the you yeah. now and the you in three months time, situation is different. You know, maybe your goals have changed, your situation have changed. Um, there's a lot of people who decided like when they first started, they're like, oh, I really want to try to learn how to become uh, let's say um, a writer, right? And then towards mm. the end, we're like, oh, maybe writing's not my thing. Maybe I should try something else, you know? And then they stop talking to their mentors who is like a writer or something like that. And then they feel bad and all that. And I'm just like, oh, you, you really shouldn't feel bad about that stuff, you know? It happens, it's fine. Like mm. uh, ambitions, dreams change all the time. What we want is the best for you. But also on, on my part is that because it's mostly a one person thing. Um, a lot of the bottleneck in terms of like managing members or like checking in on members is mostly on myself. And it, it, it kind of slightly burnt me out on the first year. So what I'm trying hard to do this year is to ask for help. <laughs> so for me, um, I just want to make sure that uh, I'm not burnt out and that I've got a support system so that there's a team of us and not just me so it's not a bottleneck yeah. mm -hmm. and then um, we can kind of keep up that momentum like having a, a few more say uh, meetups or events throughout the year rather than just one every few months so hmm. yeah it's just get, keeping up that momentum I think that's the biggest issue I see right um, okay, um, Tash, I think we have to wrap up the video section. Okay, it's fine. Um, and maybe you should turn on your OBS just in case. Why? What happened? Because Amran's house gonna black out, so he's not oh, the host anymore. So. I'm already uh, recording in... Uh, what do you call that? The, 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 the thing where we... Uh, yeah, on Zoom <laughs> itself, right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm already recording on Zoom, but if you want me to record on OBS, I can do that too. Uh, it's only because Amran's Zoom is the paid one, so his recording's unlimited. I don't know about ours. Okay, recording right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so I think let's just go through quickly uh, for Forbes 30 under 30, as well sure. as the, um, the Southeast Asia, because I feel like we really need to. It's fine if it's long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just we'll just do. I think the rest we can save for the for the article. Yeah. So six and seven, and then yeah. 
Okay. Okay, go, Dale. That's your question. <laughs> Wait, I'm gonna drink something really quickly. Look at this. Oh, he's back. Okay, he's back hosting. Yeah, should be fine now. Okay. All right, as long as he's the host. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you made it into the Forbes 30 under 30 list, right? European list, yeah. <laughs> European list, nice. So, would you say um, being a part of that list kind of sets a precedence or expectation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's still very new and surreal to me to, to be part of a very prestigious list. Um, my, <laughs> I remember my mom seeing um, a news, news news article about the Forbes 30 under 30 Asia, you know, and she was just like, oh, um, we should write to them telling them that they missed out on one Malaysian in the European list. <laughs> you know, like, oh my god, mom, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> that's what moms do. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, bless her. I love her so much. Um, but yeah, it, I do feel very honored, but also at the same time undeserving because I'm just like, oh, I'm just a regular old person doing stuff, you know. But like, um, it does, it does, um, it does make people think about you slightly differently. Um, I think it makes people have so much higher expectations of you. So for myself, the fear of the fear of failing is bigger, and it's scary, you know. Like it feels like suddenly because you have a, a um, like I wouldn't say a title, but you know something like that, it's yeah. suddenly attached to you, and suddenly you you have to be good all the time, or you know people doubt you. So that's my fear. Like it, it it's it's scary, like. Um, but I'm I'm learning to just the other way of thinking about it is that you know I've kind of just been doing what I'm doing regularly without really aiming for such things but like mm. just continue that you know because um, yeah. there's this thing about why you're doing something rather than um, for what um, and for me, I just really love what I do. Like video games has always been a huge part of my life. And I, I can see the huge joy that it gives to others, especially now in the current climate when you are stuck at home, you don't really have much else to do. Um, and a lot of people have been playing a lot more games for escapism, just to feel yeah. good. And aside from that, I love the people in the industry, you know, the, all the girls, the women um, that I want to help. And I think for me, that's, that's enough to just keep going. Um, I, I will fail and I will trip as I go along, but I hope that people are nice enough to forgive me, nice enough to give me another chance, you know? And of course you learn from it. That's part of yeah. um, learning, which is really great. Yeah. So <laughs> right now, do you think, you know, for Southeast Asia, you, you know, obviously gaming is booming right now, especially for developers. You're seeing a lot more like smaller companies just growing over here, like little mushrooms. It's really exciting. But do you think that right now is a good time to become a UI UX designer here in Southeast Asia? Um, I think it's, it's good to be anything in the in the games industry because there's there's a lot more opportunity because you know it's a it's a digital industry, right? So you work on computers, your work is digital, and it's also global. Like your end product will be played by anybody in the in, in the globe, you know. The, and the, the barrier of entry, like trying to learn how to make video games, is lower than ever. Sorry, that was a beat there. I wasn't sure what that was. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, okay, just to continue quickly. Um, but yeah, so these days it's quite easy to start making your own games. Um, there's a lot of help uh, tutorials online. Um, if you meet people on Twitter, uh, they're always there. They would love to help you out if you have a question, you know, forums. Um, and things like that. Like I'd say, it's there's no time like the present to get into something that you think is great. You know, something that you're passionate about, that you know that you could bring something new to. 
um, we could we could always use more voices, more different opinions, more more Southeast Asian stuff for sure. Like it's getting stale over here in the West. Come on, like I want to <laughs> see more stuff from from you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been seeing some really amazing stuff coming out from here as well. I've been really loving seeing. The video games uh, industry here, we're seeing a lot of new stuff, and you know maybe one day we can finally get our hung tua game that we so sorely wanted for a long time. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> okay, so just before we wrap up everything, um, do you have anything to say uh, to those who want to, you know, become like you, become an aspiring UI UX designer? Um. I would say that I didn't know what I wanted to become when I was younger. I just knew that I wanted to work in something creative. And I think um, it's okay to not know what you're doing, number one. It's okay to not achieve what you thought was your dream job because you're learning and soon you'll find out what exactly is your skill, what exactly it is what you're good at. And you will find people who want you as you are, you know? Like if you're trying so hard to fit a mold that is not you and you're not, you know, I don't want you to feel bad about yourself feeling like, oh, I'm not good enough or I'm not, you know, I'm not whatever enough. You will find that sweet spot and you will work so much harder when you realize that's exactly what you're supposed to do, you know, like you will find it. It might yeah. not be now. It might not be in five years. Who knows? Like. I'm, I I just turned 30 and I'm still trying to find out, you know, maybe there's more than just UI that I'm supposed to do. I don't know that. Maybe I'll do something else in the next five years. Very different from when I was 18, when I thought I was going to be in film. I was going to be like, you know, I'm going to work for Disney, Pixar, but <laughs> I'm working in mobile games now and I couldn't be happier. So yeah, it's okay to not know. You will get there sooner or later. All right. Okay, so that's all yeah. uh, the time we have for today. Thank you so much for uh, so being much. with us today for IGN House Call, Anissa. Uh, so if you <laughs> no guys want to follow her, you want to know more about her, follow her on her Twitter. And where else can we find your work? Um, I'm on Twitter and on Instagram at Studio Anissa. And uh, my website is studioanissa.net. It hasn't been updated in 10 years. So. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can find out more about Limit Break at www.limitbreak.co.uk. Um, if you want to start your own mentorship program in your own country, please do. I am so open to give you advice on how to start your own, your own organization because you know what? More of this could happen anywhere in the world. Believe me, if you want it to happen, you can, you can start. All right. Okay. You, hear it, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. And no that problem. wraps up this episode of IGN House Call. We'll see I you guys see next you time. Later. Bye. Bye.